is DNR ever considered in the past or possibly considering in the future to take this early goose season that we have one week and moving that to the back of the regular season because last few years uh, um, the migratory birds just start getting down here for us to be able to take advantage of that one week of early hunting. Good question. I'm going to turn to my right hand man today and uh, who's with our wildlife division to see if we can answer that question for you. Uh, there's several answers to your question. The most simple is uh, the federal framework doesn't go much past where we end the season today. I think there's a couple more days we could have selected. So we can't take that week and tie it on to the end. There is a trend with the Federal uh, Fish and Wildlife Service to run that framework a little later. Will it get much later than it is now? I don't think so, at least not in the short term. But uh, our particular approach is to run our season about as late as we can, which means up front we have to have some days in there where uh, maybe there aren't as many geese around as there would be say in late January. However, that week, that Thanksgiving week of uh, goose season is a very traditional time to get out with your family and friends, particularly with kids out of school. And that's another thing we look at, is trying to get as many days in there where folks are off work or out of school to get folks out there uh, enjoying the goose season. I'm one of the founding members of the Upper Eastern Shore Beekeepers Association, which is a new group that's been formed to serve a tri-county area. And a lot of people may not realize this, but there are a growing number of beekeepers in this area. And as you may know already, bees are an essential part of our uh, environment and uh, very important to agriculture overall. I'm making an appeal here to you uh, in terms of pillar number five and fiscal responsibility and all of that for DNR to adopt bee-friendly uh, regulations. Is there like a, do you like a list of things that uh, we, can we could take a look at? For if you. you would, I'd like to see that. Okay, um, if I can get a card from you. Um. Uh, Janet Lewis, uh, you must have heard about the Mills Ranch wind turbine project coming to Kent County. How are Kent County residents who are in great opposition to this project going to interact in such a way to have good customer service? Finding good customer service is getting the answer you want, right? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, as um, you pointed out, um, the Power Plant Research Program is part of our resource assessment service within DNR. So RAS, Resource Assessment Service, is where um, we house most of our science and monitoring um, uh, efforts and capabilities. We've got a lot of scientists there. PPRP, what they do is when applications come in from power generation, uh, for power generation facilities in the state, they come to PPRP within DNR. And they are the mm, clearinghouse, if you will, is probably a good way to put it, um, of, for six state agencies that are involved in reviewing those applications from an environmental and local impact. Um, and uh, I think right now we've got like 13 or 14 projects that PPRP is evaluating currently. There are another 15 or 16 that are getting what, what's called pre-applications, so it's kind of like a two-step thing. Um, none of those are the Apex um, Kent County Wind Farm, so nothing has been applied for. Um, at this, I will be happy to let the world know when such an application comes in. Um, we have to remain at DNR as a neutral broker, um, and so I can't sit here and tell you today that don't worry about it, I won't let that happen. Um, I do have to be very objective, uh, our department does when we review those things. Um, but that certainly doesn't mean uh, that when it happens you all shouldn't have a say. Um, and anything you want to bring to the department's attention um, as that application is reviewed, if and when it happens, we certainly want to look at and evaluate as part of the process. Okay. Yes, sir. In the application process, there's a time limit, I think, in which decisions have to be made. And in the case of Apex and the turbines, um, there's a long range study that needs to be done, and that's the setbacks to a turbine. In Western Maryland, it was arbitrarily set at, I think, a thousand feet with no scientific basis behind it. Who is going to handle that in the state to say, okay, a setback from a turbine to the nearest farm is appropriate? Because right now it's just totally arbitrary. And in the last few years, there's certain health issues that have been associated with sound generation at low 
of frequencies. Not that you could hear them, but that they're disturbing to the people that live around. Nobody is picking that up right now and taking a look at it. It's going to take a long time. And if you start processing an application, those answers won't be available unless your department or somebody gets behind it and looks at it seriously and have a scientific basis for making that decision. Well, I don't know the answer to the question of if we need time to determine an answer and we only have so much time to process an application, does that mean it doesn't get answered? I can't believe that's the, that's the result. I would think that we would have the opportunity to say in order to get an answer to this question and be and satisfactorily make a recommendation to the Public Service Commission, we need to have this study with, with you know, to see what the result is. I have been pushing for a long time for the state to shut down the oyster industry and move to aquaculture and get these watermen off the rivers and stop taking the natural growing oysters out. I ran some simple numbers. There's 18 trillion gallons of water in the bay, according to the CBF. 20 billion flow in and out every day. With the condition the bay is in, we would need over 400 billion oysters to get these waters back to a level that we've seen back in the 50s and 40s. The bottom line is, one waterman has a license for 15 bushels a day times two licenses per boat. That's 30 bushels a day times five days a week is 150 bushels of oysters. Times how many watermen do we have taking out oysters in the bay in Maryland alone? They're taking out more than what we can grow in the MGO program. In eight years, they put two billion oysters in Harris Creek and the Chop Tank and other locations based on O'Malley creating those sanctuaries. It's time to take the entire pay and put it on quarantine and get these guys to start growing these oysters like they're doing down at Hooper's Island for commercial purposes. I like oysters and oyster stew, everybody does. But until we get the bay back to a better level of health, and get the oysters to start filtering these waters the way they used to so that the plant life and the crabs and the fish and everything else can come back to the levels that we saw decades ago, we're never going to get to where we need to be. What can you as the secretary and the DNR to convince Hogan and then go to Virginia and do the same thing and say, look, this is, this is it. Go to the feds get them to get some money to help the watermen get set up in aquaculture and then ramp up the program down at Horn Point to get more oysters being grown so we can put them in docks all over the state and get these bars built up. It's going to take generations of that effort to get the bay back to where we want it to be. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to ask uh, Governor Hogan to stop harvesting oysters. Um, you know, it's a very vital part of our economy, um, the uh, commercial watermen. And uh, I personally believe, and I know the governor does too, that there is no reason why um, we, you know, we can have more oysters each year in the bay, a growing number of oysters, and have a thriving commercial public fishery as well. I think there's room for both. I talked earlier at the beginning of this meeting about how uh, conflict resolution is a big part of my job. Well, this is a good example. Um, certainly, oysters are good for the Bay. I think everybody agrees with that. And right now, I've got several, several prongs of action, if you will, regarding oysters. One, of course, is um, our sanctuaries uh, that uh, the gentleman pointed out. Uh, Governor O'Malley had uh, put in, uh, I guess he took about 25, 24 to 25 percent of the public oyster, the public shellfish harvest area, as they call it, um, in, uh, to put them aside as sanctuaries. And it w had been stated by the department and the last administration, and I've been saying the same thing, that um, we were going to take a look at science after five or six years, whatever the summer is. Um, so this July, uh, a study uh, would be uh, produced and promulgated that talked about how well those oyster sanctuaries were doing. They're either working or they're not. And they're probably working in some places better than they're working in others. And some substrate, you know, granite or foreign shell or local shell is probably doing better than others. Um, and all those factors need to be evaluated to see how they're doing. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that report so we can um, look at it and see what works and what doesn't and make appropriate actions moving forward. Um, as part of the Chesapeake Bay Agreement, which I talked about earlier, Maryland is, has agreed to restore five tributaries by restore, I mean construct oyster reefs and then have oysters grow on them, spend money with the federal government in these tributaries so that we can restore them to historical levels of oyster production. The first three of those um, were decided to be Harris Creek, the Little Chop Tank, and Tread Avon. Harris Creek is finished. 
uh, little chop tank. It's continuous work in it, and they just started working in Tread Avon. So that's three. Um, Marilyn has signed up for five. So my hope is that when we look at this study um, this next summer, that the data will be able to show us and point us in the direction of deciding what the fourth tributary ought to be. We've got to come up with five before 2025. So my goal is to pick the fourth one um, this, this next summer. But I absolutely believe that um, the bay can improve and we can do it in a, such a way as to um, keep oyster restoration, um, keep sanctuaries, um, and also keep a very vital, thriving public fishery moving forward. Um, Secretary, my name is Captain Robert Duber. I'm chairman of the Delmarva Fisheries Association. We represent people directly and indirectly in the seafood industry from Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia. And one thing that has just come, I was following it yesterday, and you talked about the bay cleanup, and it is very important to the people here in Kent County, is the um, permitting process from uh, Exelon Corporation at the Conowingo Dam and the sediment issue coming out of that. Yesterday, there was a very good discussion on the uh, process um, and Congress has decided to put a bill and pass a bill taking Maryland out of the decision making for water quality with this permit through, um, um, through uh, FERC. And it just, it, it kind of upsets me a little bit that our local congressman voted in favor of that to take your department and MDE out, and I know that you put a letter out. Um, the one thing that about this Conowingo, and Kent County does receive it, you know, I've been a waterman in Kent County for 30 years of my life, and I'm a commercial oysterman also. And, you know, a lot of people are not aware of what the major problem is, is the sediment problem we're having coming out of the Conowingo. The last storm Lee had was a 100-year record for sediment applied in the Northern Bay, which killed the majority of our oysters. I was just curious where, now that our local congressman, Congressman Harris, is, is not in favor of your department and MDE issuing this water quality permit, you know, for our economy, or for uh, Exelon, I was wondering what, what is your department now going to do to, you know, see what regulations we can put in to, you know, hold their feet to the fire? I mean, because uh, okay, the vote in the House doesn't represent a new law in the right. United States. Uh, there still needs to be a vote in the, in the Senate, and then the President needs to sign it, and we'll see where all that goes. Um, as you pointed out, Secretary Grumbles of MDE and I co-signed a letter to our uh, congressional delegation prior to this vote, um, at, and at the request of a couple of them um, who were very active in, in trying to, uh, to stop it. Um, that would have halted this bill, um, which takes Maryland out of the decision-making process for the, the Conowingo Dam water quality um, permit. I'm very disappointed to, to hear the news you, you relate to me. So what I'll tell you is that we'll, we'll double, redouble our efforts on the Senate side and see what we can't do about that. Um, I would imagine we have um, uh, an awful lot of clout on the Senate side. Our two senators, um, even though we aren't in the same party, um, they are very influential in the United States. Um, and I would imagine they would be very, uh, very uh, sensitive to Maryland State's needs in this particular regard. So, the former administration, they, they bought a party gift for one of their friends out here in Millington, in Kent County, as far as the food hub. What's it, what kind of opportunity do we have for our governor to put that back on the market, put it back in the private sector, and make $2 million back and for the state of Maryland? I was wondering if the Wick Farm was going to come up with this <laughs> topic. So on my list of um, Fiscal, re fiscal responsible, uh, fiscally responsible actions. I mentioned about the Days Cove landfill. I mentioned about Love Point Park. I mentioned about the Fort Washington Marina. This one's like fifth or sixth on my list. Um, and what we're doing there, quite frankly, is um, what, my problem is this. We have uh, all these thousands of acres throughout the state for, of public lands. Um, and I think we need to continue to conserve more property to meet our, our goals. Um, but we don't need to, I mean, when, when we buy more land, we need to pay attention to maintaining that land as well. And I don't have enough resources in the Department of Natural Resources to maintain them to the level I think would be, um, this should be the standard throughout the state. We have the level of service that we can afford, um, not the level of service that I would like to provide. Um, and part of that is looking at those properties that um, are financially and administratively intensive to, to operate. And if they don't bring in a return commensurate with that to do something about that. So with the Wick Farm, um, right now we've got some folks in our Parks Department who are looking at that specific piece of property along with others, but that one particularly, um, to try to figure out what 
publicly we might be able to do with the property to make it a worthwhile asset for the public lands portfolio. One thing we're probably going to do in the near future is put out an RFI, request for ideas, request for information, and a request for a proposal following that, that would give the public an input into, okay, here's an idea I have on what to do with that particular property. And we can evaluate what those ideas are. And if there's a good one that makes sense from a recreational point of view, an ecological point of view, a financial point of view, we're likely to pursue it. But if I can't find anything that's going to look like a, a break-even or a value for that particular property, I would be very much in favor of recommending to the governor that we declare it a surplus um, and, uh, and uh, try to sell it. Well, as um, a commissioner, I would support that. But there's several steps to go before we would get to that point. So there's a lot of caveats there. Um, there is value in having property strictly for ecological reasons, and I want to make sure we do the ecological test on that property very carefully to make sure I'm not getting rid of a piece of property that's going to could hurt us in the long run if it were developed a certain way. Um, there's there's a lot of ifs there, um, so we'll we'll take a hard look at it as as the future moves on. I'm Judy Tubman. I'm a veterinarian here in Kent County, and um, I'm going to change gears, shift gears a little bit because I have to go back to work and I can't stay much longer, but I'm also going to ruffle some feathers and bring up the Sunday hunting okay. and so forth. And I just don't know where it is, where things are right now with the Sunday hunting. Um, Ehrlich, I think Governor Ehrlich opened up the door and started allowing Sunday hunting. Prior to that, there was no Sunday hunting in the state of Maryland. And the statistics that I have read since that have been opened up, we haven't seen any decrease in the deer population in the counties that are allowing Sunday hunting and so forth. If you look at the statistics, I haven't seen any, unless you can inform me of some, I've seen no statistics that have indicated that the deer population has decreased because of increasing the deer hunting in those counties that have it on those days and so forth. So um, I am an opponent to Sunday hunting because I have a farm here in Kent County. Farms are used for other things besides deer hunting throughout the whole entire time that there is deer hunting, walking your dogs, walking your kids in the holidays, on Sundays, you know, fox chasing, riding your horses, doing whatever. And I don't know where we are with the Sunday deer hunting, but it seems right now that there's bow hunters have now asked for five sun deer hunting and so forth. And it's just the gates getting open wider and wider and wider. And our ability to enjoy our farm and our land is getting cut shorter and shorter and shorter. There are other activities on the Eastern Shore besides deer hunting and besides, you know, hunting on Sundays. Believe me, I'm all in favor of decreasing the deer population. I wish we'd extend the deer hunting two, three, four more weeks. But let leave Sunday alone. This we need our Sunday. We need one day a week that we can enjoy our land. So. Um. Uh, reducing the deer population is certainly an important part of, of hunting, but it's not the only reason hunting is allowed. It's also allowed for recreational purposes. People like to hunt just like to hunt, and they like to do it for their own meat stock for the, for the winter. Um, and uh, sometimes Sunday, okay, sometimes Sunday is all some people have available to them. That, that, being, that being said, that being said, um, there is a hodgepodge of Sunday hunting situations out there around the state. Um, and the department's attitude toward that in recent past and currently um, is that it's a kind of a local thing. Um, and what the local legislators want to do in conjunction with their local uh, county officials is, is fine. Right, so that, that has been the way it's been, deal it's been dealt with. Now I will say what that has led to is this hodgepodge framework of bills regarding Sunday hunting. Some places it's allowed, some places it's not. Where it is allowed, it's allowed in some places during this so certain Sundays and different somewhere else, and it's very confusing. It's, it's hard to talk to folks about, here's what the situation is with Sunday hunting in the state, because it, it's just uh, so much, so many different data from, from different areas. Um, that being said, what, what we are talking about doing, and I'm going to step on your toes a little bit, right. is it would be ideal from our point of view if we had something uniform throughout the state that reduce the number of Sundays that hunting occurred and, uh, you know, statewide uh, didn't ban it, but reduced it statewide and it was predictable, you know, anywhere you went in the state. So it was, it was easy to explain. The only problem with that is, and this, here's where our difficulty is, is getting buy-in from the appropriate legislators, a number of legislators to do it because, um, quite frankly, uh, it's viewed as a local jurisdiction courtesy thing. Um, and I predict that's how it's probably going to continue on, is that something that we'll leave to the local legislators. Sunday hunting is not the only tool that we've used. If you look at, and those of you who are hunters know that we've gone from 
a uh, bag limit of two deer per year to I think it's 40 or per season to I think we're up to 44 or something like that in this part of the state right now so a lot of it's uh, the bag limit it's opportunity crossbows Sundays are a real benefit because that's when folks are geared up to hunt if we can give them a Sunday in the season uh, they do uh, produce, uh, you know, they do harvest deer. So crop damage is a whole other topic, and we I spend a lot of my time working with the Farm Bureau and, and Farm Bureau members uh, trying to reduce crop damage across the state. Um, the crop damage harvest is around 9,000 deer. Uh, hunters are harvesting about 85,000 deer. So hunting is our way in, in this state to address our deer. Herd. One reason Sunday is a is a great tool for us is sometimes the Saturdays the weather's poor and this particular opening Saturday we had very warm weather across the state we had a, a lot of rain not so much here on the upper shore but in the other parts of the state and that Sunday is a day for hunters to get out and catch up and, and increase the harvest so it's an important opportunity for us and it's an important management tool so. um, okay I, we're, we're getting the hook um, some of you wanted to go hunting a little bit later I heard at the beginning um, thank you again for your uh, time. I really appreciate it. I really like coming out. So in the future, if you want to invite me back at some point, I'd love to talk to you about a specific issue, more in depth, or a whole, whole range of issues. Um, again, uh, yeah, I, I, you have one in mind, I know. Um, so, uh, but again, on that particular issue, we don't have an application before us. I'll let you know when we do. Yeah.